Welcome to Authorized Version Bible Thumper Ministries, dedicated to the gospel of Jesus Christ and preaching and teaching the word of God from the preserved and fallible King James Bible of 1611. Welcome to another installment of the Romans Expository Studies. In this study, we're going to be picking up in verse 15. So turn your King James Bible to Romans chapter 4 and verse 15. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. So keep in mind, the Jews had the law, and the Gentiles had the law written in their conscience, as we talked about in earlier studies. This verse proves that babies and children that don't understand the law are innocent until they are old enough to understand. Innocent, that, that'd be innocence. When a child, a young baby, doesn't understand that they can sin before a righteous, perfect, holy God. They don't understand that they are a sinner in his sight, that they are dead in trespasses and sins. Well, a young baby, a young child, that doesn't make them righteous necessarily, it makes them innocent. There's, there's two different things. There's innocent and there's righteous. No one who is grown up and understands the law, understands sin and all those things, no one can prove themselves righteous before God. There is no flesh uh, justified in his sight, essentially. Uh, there is not one person out there who can prove themselves righteous before God. That's why Jesus Christ came and merited salvation for us. But a baby, a child, they are innocent before God. They don't understand the law. They're not old enough to sin. They haven't reached the age of accountability where they at now understand they are a sinner before God and it's time to repent and put their faith in the gospel. They can't understand any of those things. So what happens if they die? a premature death, an early death. Well, they go to be with the Lord. Amen and praise the Lord. That, that just shows how good God is. I mean, um, uh, abort, the, for example, a very big one right there is, you know, God takes aborted baby, babies to heaven. There's a lot of wickedness in this world today that of the whole thing of the sin of abortion. People are out there aborting babies and getting rid of them and things like that and just all this terrible death and children are being... Uh, attacked and everything, and the whole thing of child trafficking. A lot of wicked stuff is happening to young children out there, and it's so satanic and it's so evil, but that's the lost world that we live in. That's the reality of this world. This world's not good. You know, it's like the old hymn goes, I'm just a straight, I'm, I'm a stranger here. I'm just a passing through. Um, it's very, very true. Uh, we as Christians, this is not our home. This is just a world that we're here temporarily until we go to be with the Lord, until our time comes, until he either catches us up or until we face death and we go to be with the Lord. Simple. So, God takes aborted babies and other children that die premature deaths straight to heaven. They get to go be with the Lord if something happens to them. Amen, amen, and amen. God is so good. That just proves how good God is. And it also, it also destroys Calvinism, by the way, because one of the biggest issues that the Calvinist theology faces, their heresies, is what do you, how do you explain babies? Did, did, did God predestinate them to go to either heaven or hell? Things like that. And a uh, Calvinist doesn't know how to answer those questions. Well, the fact of the matter is, is babies go straight to heaven with the Lord when they die. It also factors into the Lamb's Book of Life, but there's not enough time to get into that study in this, in this video. But there are other videos that I've done in the past, other studies on the Lamb's Book of Life. But the idea being is, Praise the Lord, God takes innocent children to heaven to be with him. Now go to verse 16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the to the end of to the end to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So you see right there, uh, there needs to be faith to get God's grace. There needs to be faith. It's not this vain thing. It's not, it's not this whole thing of saying, well, I believe in Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm a believer. You know, there's a lot of people out there who say those types of things. There's a lot of fakers out there who say, hey, I believe in Jesus. I, I got a cross tattoo right on my arm. I mean, if you're a babe in Christ, you're newly green, you're newly saved, and you probably don't realize that that's wrong, I can understand that, but most people who are acting that way never got truly saved to begin with, most of them. 
I mean, there are so many people out there who have who are just false converts. They profess that they've known Jesus and believe in Jesus all their lives, but there was no true point of salvation. There was no true point of conviction and repentance when they came to the actual cross. No, it's more like they had this head knowledge and they grew up in a church system and they thought they were just doing all these good things. They never really gave it a second thought and stuff like that. And they may have went to church on, the, on Sundays and things like that, went to the church buildings, but then whenever they left Sunday and Monday and the whole rest of the week came, they were doing nothing but living like a lost person. They were drinking, smoking with their friends, uh, you know, living a lost life, um, just not paying any attention to the Lord. They just went to the to the uh, church building on Sunday to put on a good show for the people there and to feel good about themselves and to do good works and think that they're going somewhere nice. Vain religion. They don't truly believe what they're doing. That is a false convert. That is someone who professes to know God and in works denies him. Uh, that it's There's a lot of people out there that are like that. And it also talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4, uh, believing in vain. People can believe in vain. There are people that don't fully come to the cross. They have just a head knowledge. They never truly got saved. They never truly came to a point of trusting Jesus Christ for their personal sins against God. They never came to that point. They just professed to know God, and they said a couple of nice things, and that was it. Never really sat down and stuck their nose in the book, started studying this book right here. They just prayed the prayers, so to speak, and went to the went to their Sunday their Sunday services, and that was it. And then those are the kind of people that die, and they lift up their eyes being in torments. They're in hell, because that is a false convert, and that is vain religion. That's somebody just doing things and not really knowing why they're doing them. You know, it's really, it's really a sad thing when you think about it. There's so many people in, the, in these buildings nowadays where they're up there and they're singing the songs and they have no idea what they're singing. They're singing some, some of those beautiful music for the Lord, beautiful hymns that have been written from uh, Christians in times past, and they have no idea what they're singing. You know, uh, there is power in the blood, things like that. When they sing that song, it's all vain. They have no idea why they're doing it, really. They don't even realize why they're singing it. Whereas when you get saved, when you get saved, it's a complete 360. You realize there is power in the blood. You realize there is, you know, the hymns that these that these actual hymns are actually, you know, are actually about you and your salvation and about other br uh, brethren and their salvation. They these songs actually come alive. You actually realize why you're singing to the Lord, rather than this vain, um, you know, the bears power in the blood, and you're just kind of doing it to. You know, please people at your local assembly and everything, a local church building, and you were never truly saved. For those out there, for people, for false converts and things like that. I mean, that's, vain, again, vain religion. Whereas when you're saved and you sing those songs, you completely understand why. It's a part of my testimony. When I first got saved, I remember it like plain as day. I totally understood why we sing these songs now. I totally understood amazing grace. How sweet the sound. I finally understood that, that music. It, it, was, it actually came alive to me. It, it made sense. It's God saved a wretch like me. Whereas before when I sang that song, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't really care. That All I could think about is when, does, when am I out of here? <laughs> when am I out of here and back, on, back home to doing my wicked stuff, you know, seeking after my, my own... Um, fleshly lusts and things like that. That was my attitude back then. But then after being saved, it completely changed. It's, it's, it really is a miraculous thing. And that's people in their vain religion. And also back to verse 16 here. Notice it says, All the seed. Therefore is of faith that it might be by grace to the, to the, end, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. Notice, all the seed. That would be Jew and Gentile. We are of the faith of Abraham. Let me read that part too. But to, but to that also, which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Notice that, father of us all, the faith of Abraham. We are of that faith. And Abraham is, quote unquote, you could spiritually, spiritually speaking, the father of us all, the father of our, uh, the uh, the faith. You have Judaism, real Judaism, which is Old Testament uh, law, law keepers and things like that. And then the New Testament came, 
which is New Testament Christianity, which fulfills the law in us when we accept Christ on the cross. We receive imputed righteousness. We receive his merits. God merited salvation for us so we don't have to do the works of the law anymore. So what is Christianity? It is completed Judaism. That is what Christianity actually is, it is completed Judaism. That is what we are. Everything that the law says a Jew to do is fulfilled in us when Jesus Christ comes into us. When Jesus Christ enters this body that is dead in trespasses and sins and quickens us and makes us alive and makes us born again, we have now fulfilled the whole law in ourselves because Jesus merited it for us. We no longer have to keep the law. We're set free. Amen and amen and amen. We don't have to keep the Sabbath day for all the Seventh-day Adventists out there. We don't have to keep uh, all these different ordinances and things like that under the law for the Hebrew Rudists that want to try to you know, bring you back under and put a yoke upon you. I mean, how dare they do it? Their damnation is just. And if they don't repent, I pray they do. I really do. I pray. I, I, I love people. I want people to be saved. I want people to repent of their wickedness. But if the Hebrew Rudists and the Seventh-day Adventists and the law keepers out there don't repent of their self-righteousness and those satanic works that they keep trying to push on new baby Christians and mess them up, they're going to go to hell, and righteously so. I pray that if you were someone that's like that, that you would repent and realize you don't have to trust in yourself. You don't have to trust in works. You don't have to trust in any of that. All you have to do is trust in Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your personal sins against God. Continuing here. So, uh, and also note, uh, just a side note, the, um, the, uh, the promised land would be the millennial kingdom, by the way. This actually does, these, Abraham and everything, the promises that were to the Jewish people, part of that is the land grant as well, which we will be in the millennial kingdom among the Jews in our spiritual forms. Once the Lord catches us out of here, or if we're already passed away and we get resurrected, we have our new bodies, we will be in the millennial kingdom among uh, actual people still in the flesh. Whole nother study, the Millennial Kingdom is a very big study and everything. I've done studies on it before, but the idea being is that we will be spiritual beings among fleshly people in the Millennial Kingdom. It's going to be pretty interesting. Uh, I'm looking very, very much looking forward to it. It's going to be uh, quite, quite an experience to, uh, to be resurrected in the spiritual body and see fleshly people in the Millennial Kingdom. But that's, that is a part of it. That's a part of the, the promise to us. We have imputed righteousness and we will be with the Jews in Jerusalem when the Lord comes back and takes his city and we become resurrected, get caught up in the rapture, or if you're passed away by then, the Lord's going to resurrect you and you're going to be there with him in your spirit in your spiritual body, your new body. And now go to verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as they as though they were. So verse 17 is very important. Uh, that would be an Old Testament quote. And the Old Testament quote would be in Genesis 17.5. So keep your hand there in Romans. Don't lose your spot. And go to Genesis 17.5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. So that's an Old Testament quote. And as you can see right there, a father of many nations. That is Jews and Gentiles together. Again, amen. That's just so that's I mean that is really that really is amazing. That that prophecy in the Old Testament and then it is fulfilled. And then on top of all that, the mysteries revealed that many nations, that would include Gentile nations, Gentile and Jew together in the body of Christ. Amen. That, that's praise the Lord for his book. Really praise the Lord. And then back to back to verse 17 here a little bit more before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. So what's that saying there? That's basically saying that um, that Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old at the time. 
and God had to quicken their bodies for reproduction because the Lord was promising uh, Abraham heirs. He was promising him uh, a people and everything like that. So part of that is Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. They're well past the age of being able to have children. <laughs> so again, that's where God is quickening. That would be the quickeneth, the dead, meaning the dead parts of the body, the dead parts of the body that aren't repro you know, aren't reproducing the and everything like that. He had to quicken that and call those things which be not as though they were. So the Lord is the one who gave uh, them their children. The Lord is the one who gave Sarah her baby. And he did that by quickening those those parts that were dead essentially on their bodies, the re reproduction. And then verse 18, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to, or according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So these next verses are stages of faith. They're very much stages of faith. We grow in faith. We get stronger. As, the, as time goes on and you're a Christian, if you're studying your Bible, you're really seeking the Lord, you're seeking truth, you're wanting to grow as a Christian, these are stages. You will begin to grow and become much, much stronger in your faith. They may not feel feel like it right now. I really want to speak to the newest, to the new brethren. Maybe some of you got saved within the last year, saved within the last few months. I don't know. Uh, just within a very short time frame that you've been a Christian. I really want to encourage you with this because I know this, the struggles that you feel when you first get saved, they feel almost impossible to overcome. And we're about to go over a stages of faith right now. This is very important. So keep in mind, it's, it's not abnormal to struggle really, really hard when you first get saved. And a lot of people, when they struggle like that, they tend to doubt their salvation. They have a lot of issues. They begin to kind of you know, they begin to get doubtful, as, and as a result, it's it's like Satan capitalizes on that and messes with their minds even more and, and makes them feel terrible. I, I you know, I, I really, I, I talk with brethren, they have all these struggles and everything with, you know, things like that because they're new. They need to grow, and that's perfectly fine. And, you know, I being there to encourage, and especially for all you seasoned brethren out there, if you're watching this, being there as an encouragement to your younger brethren, being an, being an encouragement and Letting them know, hey, you just gotta grow. But we'll get into get into this. So we grow in faith, we get stronger. And Abraham Abraham knew uh, knew he was too old to have children, yet he had hope even without reason to hope. That's what it's saying right there. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So again, you that's Abraham, he's, he's against hope, he's against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. So, you see right there how he's, essentially, he realizes that he has no reason to hope, I mean, he, he, he's well past the age of having children, but he still has hope. He's trusting God. I mean, you come to God with a problem, and it feels, it really does, it feels like there's no hope. But yet, you still have hope, and it begins to grow. Very important to understand. If you if you have a problem and you bring it to God and everything, you feel like there's no hope, but yet you still have hope. Why? Because it's God Almighty we're talking about here. <laughs> it's God Almighty we're talking about. That the one who can do all things. God can do anything. And that you still have that hope. And with that hope, it begins to grow. Your faith begins to grow. And when you start to grow, that's, I mean, it, it just gets so fun from there. It really does. It, it just, as faith grows, as you grow as a Christian, it gets funner, funner, and funner, and harder. Harder, harder, and funner at the same time because Satan and will attack you. He will wage, the, there will be spiritual warfare and everything as you grow. But at the same time, you're reading the word, you're learning, you're learning about God, you're learning about doctrine, you're learning about instruction and righteousness, you're learning all these things that the Lord tells us about, how to live our lives on this earth and also what to expect in the world to come. All these amazing, beautiful, wonderful things, and it's so fun, it's the greatest, and at the same time, of course, you're being attacked by Satan because he wages spiritual warfare, and just spiritual warfare in general, war with the flesh, so on and so forth. So... Again, uh, you begin to grow, and you have hope. 
verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So right there, now he's not considering these factors. All of a sudden, he's, he's not considering the deadness of Sarah's womb or the fact that he's a hundred years old. Interesting. He's stronger in faith. If you let a problem overtake you and become bigger than God, it can mess with you big time. If you let something overtake you and you feel like there, there's no way out and everything and you begin to forget in your mind that God is bigger than your problem, uh, it's going to mess with you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make, I mean, and it's just going to be more spiritual warfare in, in those cases. I mean, God is bigger than our problems. That's something we have to remember. God is far bigger than anything we're facing. Any problems we're having, any challenges, God is bigger than that, and he can do anything. So, again, um, when it happens, you, know, you have to realize that God is bigger than your problems. Put your faith in that. Trust him and watch your faith grow. You know, remember that. Whatever it is that you're facing out there, I mean, if you got to realize that God really is bigger than, than that problem that you're facing and that he will take care of it. He will take care of you. I mean, it, it's so important. If you really start to believe that that problem is somehow bigger than God, it's going to mess you up. And you're, gonna, you're not going to have any peace, and it's just going to, you know, you got to realize that God's there, and he will take care of you. you know, that The old hymn, God will take care of you. Not the best thing in the world, but you get the point. <laughs> so, again, amen to that. Verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Amen. Abraham's not staggering. He's strong in faith. If you're struggling with things, maybe your own salvation, because a, a lot of brethren go through that, etc., um, you need to grow. Read this book, because I was, I was the exact same way. There were so many times where I doubted my own salvation when I first got saved. I was all over the place. I was having so many issues with sin and things like that at first, and sanctification. On top of all that, I was at the time, I did not realize to rightly divide the Bible. And like I've said many times in these studies, if you don't rightly divide this book and realize what's being written to you and what's not, You'll get yourself screwed up. You'll go to scriptures that are clearly written to a group of people that can lose their salvation. In the time of Jacob's trouble, the book of Revelation, when the Antichrist is here offering the mark to people, which we will not be here to experience, you will get all messed up. You'll start to think, can I lose my salvation? Do I have to keep myself, do I have to keep myself in the love of God or do I have to keep myself saved? Uh, is the, is it? you start to get all these crazy ideas in your mind and it really messes with you. What's happening? You haven't grown yet. <laughs> Amen. That's what happened to me. I was not, I was, I didn't grow yet. I didn't realize that I need to really sit down and study this book. And it took a lot of mistakes for me to finally realize I need to take a step back and read this book, spend a lot of time in here and figure out what it actually says. Very, very important. Um, I can't stress that enough. Uh, you, you have to spend time in the Word of God. You have to actually put work into this book, put work into study. Yes, it takes work. It takes a lot of work to study this Word and stu study this book. You have to actually dedicate time to studying this book and spending 40 minutes, an hour, however long you need, really. I mean, uh, let, your, let yourself, if, if you have all the time in the world for whatever reason, go wild with this book. Spend as much time as you can. Spend five to six hours a day if you can do it. If you don't get too weary in the flesh, I mean, go right ahead. Absorb as much as you can. Learn this book. Spend time with God, praying over it and everything like that. Uh, and you will see yourself grow. You will see yourself really growing from where you, where you once were. So, again, it's, it's one of those things. When people, when brethren and stuff, they're struggling with, with their salvation, things like that, you just have to grow. You have to grow. Simple. Get in the Word, stay in the Word. And verse 21. And being, fully <clears throat> and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, promised he, was all, he was able also to perform. Very important right there. Fully persuaded. Now you see Abraham right here. Fully persuaded. That's a profound statement. Uh, Abraham's faith grew. You know, no move, no moving uh, Abraham at this point. 
I mean, again, God can do anything. Right there, Abraham's fully persuaded now. God can do anything, and Abraham knows it, as it's talking about these stages. And, you know, it reminds me of how we are, as how we ought to be as Christians, how we ought to be for the brethren out there. Um, we should very much be fully persuaded. I am fully persuaded that I am eternally secure, born again. I have a perfect Bible. This is God's perfect book in the English language. Uh, I am that I will be cut up before the time of Jacob's trouble. I am fully persuaded that I will be raptured out of here before the time of Jacob's trouble, before the book of Revelation comes to pass and the Antichrist is revealed. We will be gone before then. I am fully persuaded. There is no changing my mind. Any heretic comes at me, I know exactly how to cut him down with this sword. Very important. I know how to take the Bible and cut him down to size and prove, it, prove to him that he's completely wrong and heretical and he needs to repent. But I'm fully persuaded on that. I'm full and I'm fully persuaded that you don't have to keep the Sabbath day or any other Jewish ordinances and will be resurrected at the last day. I'm fully persuaded. I don't have to keep the Jewish law. I don't have to do anything to keep my salvation or prove something to God or something like that. I have to sanctification's there. All those types of things. You know, having a God living godly in this present world, having a godly changed life. Yes, amen and amen. But I am fully persuaded that I do not have to keep Jewish ordinances in order to be saved. I don't have to keep the Sabbath day. I don't have to keep any of that. All I have to do is love my neighbor as myself. I mean, and I will be resurrected at the last day. I'll be resurrected. God finished his work in me eternal, eternally secure. If you are truly saved out there, then you have the exact same future coming for you. Amen, amen, and amen. And verse 22, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. So you see right there, again, imputation. Uh, Abraham is a typology of what we are now. That's the doctrine of imputation. It's been imputed to him for righteousness. We have the merits of Jesus Christ imputed to us for righteousness, meaning the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the perfect life that he lived, the perfect Jewish life. He was a perfect Jew under the law. He kept all the ordinances. He kept all the days. He did everything correctly. He imputed and merited all that for us and imputed it to us at salvation. We are justified freely by his grace. That's what he did for us. So again, no law keeping. You don't have to do it. It's already been fulfilled in you. The Holy Spirit that's in you already fulfilled the law. Therefore, you don't have to keep the law. Amen. Again, in a typology, remember, as I said in the previous studies, Abraham was not eternally secure, per se, in the Old Testament. He was not eternally secure. He was not born again the same way that we are now. The Holy Spirit didn't come and live inside him forever. It wasn't Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4.30, that scripture is, the, is a New Testament scripture for Christians. Abraham had to have, there were works involved. He was doing things, God was having him prove himself and things like that. He had to have faith plus works. But again, he is a type of what we are today, imputed righteousness for following what, for trusting in God in the Old Testament. Very important. Typologies are, are wonderful in Scripture. They really are. They're, they're amazing. And verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, and that would be Real quickly, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. Now it was not written. What was that saying? Well, actually, jump on over to Romans 15. Keep your hand there, Romans uh, 4. Romans 15. Romans 15 and verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Amen and amen. God's book. I love this. Uh, amazing. Just scripture ties in with scripture, spiritual and spiritual. Amen. Uh, that's it. It's written for our learning that we might have hope. Again, when you're a New Testament Christian and you get heretics out there that are telling you all these terrible things, you've got to keep the law. Why, why, why would God 
give someone eternal security. That's not right. A Christian, a Christian can't just go on sinning. Well, we want to live godly in this present world to please our Father. He will chasten us. The Bible talks about that. We'll get to that in our studies soon enough. But we can never lose our salvation. That we might have hope. A typology of Abraham getting imputed righteousness to him, therefore, is now passed down to us, and we are fully and completely, compl uh, our salvation is completed. Again, written aforetime for, uh, that we might have hope. We have hope. We have eternal life. Amen. And verses 24 to 25. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Again. Imputation. God merited salvation for us. And that's the end of story. It says it right there for our justification, not our conditional justification or our uh, justification based on our own merits. No, it says justification. Declarative. Declaring us righteous. We are justified 100% forever. End of story. End of debate. Not Seventh-day Adventism, not Hebrew Rudism, not Calvinism, not Ar um, Arminianism, not any of those isms. No, we have been justified freely. Amen, amen, amen. But that is actually the end of this study, brethren. So we will pick up in the next one in Romans chapter 5. So I pray this is a blessing to you out there. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank you for watching Authorized Version Bible Thumper Ministries. James chapter 4 and verse 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. The gospel is this. Romans chapter 3 verses 10 to 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Friend, you are not a good person. Romans chapter 3 verses 19 to 23. Now we know what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Have you ever lied, cheated, fornicated, or even killed? James 2 verse 10 for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You have sinned against a perfect, holy God. The punishment for sin is eternal hell. Matthew chapter 5 verses 29 to 30. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 11 Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Do you fear God? Are you sorry for your sins? Are you desperate for salvation? A new life? 2 Corinthians 7.10 For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. The Good News 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 
Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day for your personal sins against God, so that you can be justified. Romans 3 verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 to 13, that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on the Lord, ask for the free gift, and receive the new birth today. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new.